Well, thanks for having me here. This is lovely. I, I live down in Austin, so it's nice to come up and get really cold in the morning and then warm in the afternoon. Because, man, the weather down there can be awful. It's actually nice this time of year. You should come down. If, you, if you're ever considering Austin, now's the time to come. Don't come in the summer. You'll hate it. But you'll love it. You'll get trapped by a house. You won't be able to leave. August will hit, and you'll still love it. It'll be fine. Anyways, that's an introduction I've never given. So uh, <coughs> this, this is an uh, uh, overview. I'll, I'll get into what donkeys are here, but you can tell I have a, uh, an odd affinity for, uh, for zombies here. If I remember, I forget which one... Uh, you know, night is. Sometimes it's land, sometimes it's others. I think land is my favorite of the zombies movie. That's the one with the, there's a clown you can catch for a split second down in the missile silos. Um, but what this talk goes over, as, as I'll get into, uh, is essentially an overview of, of why we should be interested in DevOps and what it is. It provides the context for doing it. Now, probably since you're here at this event, you're very interested in it. But I think it's good, especially if you go back to your place of work or your team, that you can kind of articulate why it's important and what's going on out there. Now, I'll only spend a little bit of time going over that. And then I, I want to go over kind of like the challenge that we're going to be facing, those of us who are interested in DevOps and getting it more widespread and spreading it out more. And that's really what my interest is, 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 is uh, I, I guess you could say evangelizing the, these ideas and figuring out how to get them spread out into the world. That's why I, I come to events like this to talk and just hang out and see what's happening. Um, and then I'll go over about uh, seven tips, if you will, that are, are, are kind of like a good launching point for, for what I think the best advice is at an, at an organization level for, for doing DevOps, right? Like, I don't really go into as, as many of the other talks here, like the actual tools you would use, what the day-to-day -day is, and also sort of like the, the kind of like mental models of how to talk with each other and start uh, thinking about it. But what I've found over the years, uh, as I'll get into with my, my bio, having been an analyst and doing other things, is that it's often the, uh, the middle management and above layers who need a significant amount of help to start doing the right thing and, and coming over there. So a lot of this is kind of pitched at the idea of what you might call managing upwards, like, like what you might want to have management start doing to, uh, in order to start doing fun stuff like DevOps. So if, if you had the chance to read through all of this while I was talking, uh, you know, it's nicely fine print there, but I always like to begin with these conclusions. That way you're free to leave at any time, and, and I can get my points across. And it also helps me remind me what it is I was going to talk about. So now that I'm refreshed, allow me to do the standard thing of establishing credibility. So hello, this is me. Uh, I, I, I work at Pivotal, as was mentioned. So what I do there is I work in the Pivotal Cloud Foundry group. And uh, I always feel a little awkward saying this, but I basically do evangelism, right? I do things like this. I try to explain what it is we do and try to go over uh, how we're kind of on this mission to improve and make software better, as, as we'll get into, and, and just trying to explore and help that out. I mean, and it is technically marketing, so I would really like it if you came and visited us at the table and marketed with us. As, as my boss, Andrew Schaefer, likes to say, come engage with my brand. And, uh, you know, so that, that's enjoyable. Now, I, uh, I, I worked for, uh, I guess, a total of maybe eight years or so at two different firms being an industry analyst, where I covered software development and, uh, and things like cloud and open source. And, and this crowd usually probably actually likes this. Things like systems management, right? Like monitoring. Usually that makes people fall asleep. Uh, but it, that was an exciting uh, thing to cover. And uh, way back when, when I actually did real work, I uh, was a software developer. I worked at BMC Software. Sorry if you use Performance Manager. That's probably some of my responsibility in there, the only code running around. Uh, but yeah, and then I worked at a couple of startups and things like that doing development. And uh, I sort of changed my hobby of uh, liking the tech industry and following it and reading up on it into the various jobs that I've had beyond programming. And if you're interested in my, uh, I don't know, style of prattle about nonsense, you can go to my website down there, or check out the columns I write about DevOps. And I am really interested, as people uh, know who came up to the table this morning, and figuring out what people are doing with software and new ways of doing it, best practices. I guess worst practices are good, too. I like a good train wreck. Uh, but like, if, if, those, if those are the kind of things you like talking about, it'd be great to, uh, to follow up with you in person or, or off in the land of the internet there. Um, so with that delightful self-promotion over, um, you know, usually the way that, that, that I frame this kind of thinking uh, when we go over what's happening in the industry and why we care about DevOps and, and and like cloud and all this stuff, I, I kinda, I've been posing it as fear of nerds, if you will. So this fear that uh, Silicon Valley, that other people are, are coming over to like disrupt and change normal business. But I've been realizing that that's a pretty like cynical way of looking at it. So I'm trying to become happier. 
Uh, and, and instead, like, I, I want to kind of position this idea of like, we have this opportunity to make software better. Now, you know, many people in this room, you might have the opportunity to like provision a server better. That's delightful too, right? Like, whatever it is your function in the stack of software is, pretty much, is this true? I, I don't really know about physical data center management very much or management of real estate, but pretty much all the layers underneath software there's this wonderful opportunity that only happens every 10 or so years to make it a lot better to focus on the craft of it. So, like I said, I'm trying to be more optimistic nowadays and think about making better software rather than freaking out about all those crazy West Coast people coming in and stealing your business. But to that end, if you like freaking out instead of craft, I think, I think this summarizes a lot of the environment that's sort of pushing down from the outside layers, like why folks in this room and other places are are being asked to like look into DevOps and cloud and like more is being expected of IT. And you see that this is from the annual shareholder letter of uh, JPMC, as, as we like to say in the trade, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and, and it's from their CEO and it's this great quote that I've condensed a little bit. But it's basically this recognition that over my career has only happened recently where non-tech companies now essentially realize that tech companies are coming after them and they want to do something about it. And it's really that second part that's an amazing shift, right? Like, I don't think it's that often that, as we would say, enterprises have really thought about software as a primary thing that they should be concerned with, right? But you have uh, the stereotypical examples of, you know, Uber and Square and Airbnb, and you can just name kind of um, probably any industry. And there is some company that often is thought of as a tech company, but if you think about it, they're like a normal company that's really using software to change how they do their business, right? Like, I mean, think of the most stereotypical example like Uber, like how boring is a taxi service? Like that's not really too awesome, just conceptually, but like, I mean, I use that app a lot when I travel, like because they have this team of software developers like writing software on the back end and front end, like it's pretty awesome, right? Like there's all this interesting excitement and business happening there. So anyways, this is definitely something we see um, when we, we move around in the pivotal spaces, companies are really uh, uh, desperate to be cynical about it, to start learning the craft of software and start not only writing good software, but delivering that good software and keeping it up and running, right? Because as I was joking with someone this morning, right? Like to, to steal a, a moniker of a local uh, town favorite here, right? Like and kind of bastardize it, like running is job one, right? Like you need to keep the thing running. If it doesn't run, it might as well not exist, which is a lot of what, as we'll get into, uh, DevOps kind of brings to the table to improve the overall software. Now, as I mentioned, if uh, fear doesn't motivate you, and you're kind of like, ah, I'm a fancy computer person, whatever companies come and go, I can get a job anywhere I want, so what do I care if the business is successful? You know, good luck. But uh, anyways, uh, there's also the chance, as I was saying, that uh, we really can improve the craft of our software. Like, we can make it much better. Back when I was working at BMC and uh, those, those other uh, vendors that I worked at, um, you know, not all of my teammates were this way. Some of them, uh, you know, I was a younger person then. Some of them actually wanted to get home and like back to their real life instead of just making great software. And we didn't have a great process for doing that. But anyways, there was a certain like pride that you would have when you would finally deliver the software and it was used by people and it was good, right? And again, we really have that chance up and down the stack to improve the craft. So you have these two motivations to pay attention to uh, basically DevOps and cloud, if you will. One of them is that businesses really want software. They want to become software companies. And it's important, not like gratuitously, because like they want to have an experience like Facebook or whatever, but because their customers expect to interact with them through really good software. And so there's that pull to do that. Now the second one, again, is, is that basically we have this chance to make much better software. We can kind of leap in the quality of it uh, from where we've been in the past. And those are the two things, I think, that are creating this environment where, like with DevOps days, we're able to have, like, almost every week there's a DevOps days nowadays. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but during conference season, there are many DevOps days because there's, there's a huge pull to really improve the way that IT is delivered. So in a situation like this, where there's a pull to improve something, it's good to establish a baseline to figure out, like, so everyone's expecting the IT department to give us this awesome software. And it turns out that like, there's almost like this, uh, this sort of apocalypse coming, you know, hence back to the zombies and everything. But like, if, if you look at the current state of IT departments, I'm sure no one's company in here has this problem. You guys are probably all awesome. But when you go back out into the world, you should be aware that when you talk with your peers, chances are they suck as, as in aggregate, right? So we need, to go, we need to go help them. We need to bring the awesomeness you have to the rest of, of the industry out there. And, 
you can, you can, there, there's two things that kind of lead, that kind of point to this apocalypse, if you will, that, and, and further motivates us to figure out how we, sh we need to help out with, with things like DevOps and cloud. So the first one is, is this prediction from, uh, from Gartner. And it's great. Now that, I, now that I don't work at an analyst company, I can acknowledge the existence of other analyst shops. It's very, very exciting for me. There's many of them out there. But there's this great prediction that you can look up. It's actually in a press release, so you don't have to go beyond their paywall. But there's this notion that because of software as a service, because of, of cloud and all these things that we talk about, more and more companies in the future will be building versus buying the things that they have, right? So there'll be this pull to write their own software and build their own things that are customized to their business, not just like keep the exchange server up and running or keep the SharePoint you know, disk running. And I think this is really uh, pulled out by the equation I like. I call it uh, IT minus SaaS equals what, right? So think about all the effort that you put into managing your on-premise package software. And if you just like vacuumed all of those resources, time, money, priority, stress, thinking out of, out of the company, as, as people who, who are cynical quickly suggest, well, I could fire all those people. So that's delightful. Or you could like use those resources to do something new and interesting, right? And you're probably not going to manage more packaged software. You can do some desktop management, keep the network up. But what, what you can start using those resources for is making custom software that helps run your business better, which plugs into those two motivations that we had. So then we got all excited about that. And then we have this little sad guy over here. Look how sad he is. He's, he's, just, he's, he's not up to good stuff. But if, if you kind of read this bar chart, so this is, this is from a... Uh, it's a, it's a low end, so it's a little like shoddy. It's only 80 organizations they talked with. But I think it summarizes a lot of what I've seen over the years. That The question is, what's IT's role in business innovation? And, and let's just kind of rephrase that as like, so is IT helpful, <laughs> right, essentially? Because like, we would assume we want IT. I guess there could be a question. What's IT's role in keeping the lights on? And that's probably moderately OK. But as far as coming up with new things and being as this answer says, a key enabler for business innovation. If you look at the top, the answer in 2013, then it's 2014, it's 2015. I mean, hopefully you know how to read a chart and you can see the decline, but there's this embarrassing, almost shameful level of like only about a, a third of, of people out there think that IT is helpful, which is like horrible. Like, what have we been doing? Again, not the people in this room, but, but your peers. <laughs> I'm sure you guys, you guys are in that, that, that third part there. But, you know, you look at this and other things, and like IT is in this state where like it's not really ready for this oncoming crush of like custom software development out there, right? Like we're not really prepared with the tools and the practices and the culture. And so much like why I like DevOps so much is so much of DevOps is geared towards fixing that problem, which which is wonderful. So, in order to address this issue, a, a lot a lot of the sort of like advice and and things that you get out there is sort of like this, right? Like. You just have this cloud come over here, and he's going to throw rainbow goodiness all over you. And, th and then, like, it's going to be perfect, right? And, and the steps are basically, like, draw these circles and then draw the rest of the owl, right? Like, this is, this is pretty much like if you go follow, like, most news on the internet, what you end up reading and, and hearing, right? Like, and, and, and we all know, I mean, the joke, the, I don't know if it's a punchline, but the, the, uh, the addendum to the joke is, like, all the interesting stuff is in here, not pictured. Right? And, and that's, that's, that's where the difficulty comes in and, and a lot of what we need to focus more and more on. And again, uh, from, from sort of like a managerial, mid-level, high-level stance, I'll get to what some of those steps are in there. And throughout the rest of the talks, hopefully you can fill out some more of uh, how to get the owl drawn. So, you know, paying attention to what's in those middle steps between the circles and the owls is really important because we're not all like, you know, the A-team. Well, again, everyone in this room. We'll see how, we'll see how long I can ply that joke for, uh, for laughs. That sounded like the last instance. But we're, we're not all like, uh, sort of like, you know, we don't all like weld a bunch of corrugated steel to a van and like in, I don't know, 35 minutes or so, rescue the kidnapped kid. Like we need some like process and some tools, like we need some learning and training. We're, we're a lot more, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll be missing that meeting. Uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're a lot more like prone to like need to know how to do things rather than just have like the insane person and the, and the handsome dude and the guy with the mohawk kind of just like figure it out. And, and I think because of that, like, you see these kind of predictions, which I think are very real, right, in the sense that there's a lot of people out there who will be trying DevOps and trying cloud and trying to do this new thing. And if they don't make the right kind of organizational changes, what I'll, I'll soon argue are meatware changes, right? They're not software or hardware problems. They're problems with us. Like, there's going to be a huge amount of failure. So here we are. We've got motivation to be better at software. And it looks like it's going to be a disaster. So you'll never guess what happens next. But first. 
because uh, it's a DevOps days. And I, I don't always use all the standard like slides and everything. I've spread out some obligatory slides here so I can reach my quota. It also give you a time to mentally pause. Here's some silos. <laughs> so with that, let's go into how we can help out the donkeys. And, and, and as, as you can probably imagine, donkeys are essentially like these folks who are at risk of failing, right? Like they're regular, regular sorts of things and, and, and they need help in becoming awesome, essentially. And I, I use this phrasing. There's actually a, uh, 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 I forget what do you call it, when, when someone's done something before you in, in patent law or whatever, there's some prior art, if you will, about goats. And, and I don't mean to steal uh, Deucey's thunder or anything. Like he's got a great podcast, The Goat Can. It's wonderful, actually. Like somehow he gets actual enterprises to come talk on the record, which if you've ever worked in marketing, that never happens. So I don't know what he does, if he slips them something or, or whatever, but he gets them on there. You should go listen to that podcast. But instead of goats, I think of, of them as donkeys. And I, and I think this sort of like uh, tranching of, of categories is really important if you're out there like learning how to do new things in IT. Because most everything that you read about ever is over in this unicorn area. Right? Which is sort of like when you read like, well, uh, what's, what's the routine of like an athlete or the diet that like a superstar is on? Like that's not probably going to fit into your life, but that's what you read about over and over again, right? And these unicorns over here, right? They have like unlimited resources. They can hire like whoever they want and keep, you know, pay them crazy things. And those people also always leave all the time, right? Like the old, the old, the old uh, thing is like, you know, if you hire a rock star, you expect them to behave like a rock star, if you remember the 80s. Uh, and, and like, you know, basically they're, they're, they're awesome, they sound good, but they're about as unrealistic as that picture up there, right? Like they're fire-breathing unicorns with, you know, cats riding on them. And again, if you're in that situation, mazel tov, right? Like, great, in, enjoy. But most of us are in one of these other two categories over here, right? So in the middle, we have this category that I would call like the war horses, right? I won't try to pronounce the fancy French for it. But like, they're, they're not quite mythical. But you know, they're really expensive to maintain. They've got a lot of resources. They're big and bulky. And they may be kind of slow moving and not always up to speed, but they, what they do have is like willpower, right? So when, when the war horses decide to move, they, they really like end up moving. They can put a lot of effort behind it. And they, they also need a fair amount of help uh, charting things out, but they at least have lots of resources and, and uh, just you know, sheer bulk, which, which is helpful. Now, on the end of the spectrum is, is our friend the donkey. Right? I think this is basically most of us. Like we, we operate under this, this, this uh, great phrase of what is it? Do more with less. And like every year like, like we're basically asked to always do more things and do them faster and better. And we're not, you know, we don't have all the free organic beef jerky and sriracha cashew nuts and stuff that the unicorns do. And we don't sort of have like the big, the big payroll that the, 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 the war horses do. Like all we're really trying to do, as illustrated here, is like somehow find a spare carrot and put it on our head and pretend we're a unicorn, right? Like we just want to improve. And, and what, I, what I like about the donkeys, right, is, is basically as the first bullet point there says, right, like they're, they're genuinely like hardworking beasts of burden. Like they really have pride in what they're doing. They're not just kind of loafing around. They're not like that lazy cricket that, uh, you know, tries to graft off the ants come winter. They're, uh, they're, they're very genuine uh, good folks. So, you know, situate yourself where you are in that spectrum. And, cause I, I, and, and also, I think it's important to situate advice, situate advice that you get where it comes from, right? Like, if a unicorn or a warhorse or a donkey is giving you advice, think about, does that apply to me, right? Like, do I, do I have the same capabilities they have to follow the things that they do? And, and I, I would suggest that, you know, again, most people fit in that, that last category, hence my, my affinity to, uh, to, to donkeys. Now, the issue that starts to come up is, uh, as you can see in this survey, and, and again, uh, you know, the, the, the problem with surveys and charts, you learn as you're an analyst, is you can basically pick and choose whatever you want to say whatever you want, right? But this one is actually pretty representative, you just have to trust me on this, is representative of, of what I generally see, is when you ask people what, where, while, how their projects are failing, like why IT is not working out, if you read through these answers, very few of them are like the technology is the problem, right? Like the stuff doesn't work. And, and when I look at this in other charts, right, what, what this makes me think of is that really it's the meatware that's the problem. It's the way that we're using the technology, managing it, thinking about it. Like all of these issues are really what the, the, uh, the impediments are, uh, essentially to it. And, and you see this over and over again. And uh, you know, this is actually a pretty good survey with, with a high end from, uh, from, I don't know, it's got the word MIT in it, so it must be legit, right? 
But I think this is also another thing, like, like throughout the years of DevOps, like I, I, I go back and forth getting frustrated about why we talk about culture so much. But this is kind of the core issue, because when you look at it, failure comes up from process and behavior and what people are doing. And so there's that emphasis on, on culture. And if you'll allow me a small little parable, which is factually pretty incorrect, but that's why I call it a parable, because it's a story uh, that, that matches. Let me, let me illustrate this point, and then I'll, I'll show you a fancy pie chart as well. But so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, the culture of the men's room, these are urinals. They're one of the two options we have when we go in there. I mean, I guess you could think of the sink as an option, but that's not really civilized. <laughs> But this is one of the, sort of like the, the express route, uh, if you will. And I, 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 found these, uh, I found these up in Columbus. And these are like wonderful ones, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if, uh, you know, you like old stuff as much as I do, but you, these, these are an older version of it. There's newer ones, and they just, they're just not too appealing, right? But <laughs> the, these old ones, like, they, they, they're very comforting. Now, there's other ones, just for those who aren't familiar, they go all the way down to the floor. And I see those in Costco all the time. Those are a real treat, if you see those. <laughs> but... So again, all of this is a little shoddy as far as the facts, but it's, good, it's a good pattern to illustrate. And also, I back this up with one of our field engineers whose dad wrote the, uh, the textbook on plumbing that's used, that was used the most here in America. If you're really excited, I got a reference there. Uh, but so you look at these, and like, while these are delightful, they use a tremendous amount of water, right? Like almost, it looks like a gallon of water. And so someone thought, like, if you look up top, there's no handles, right? Like, if someone was probably thinking, like, we should conserve water, because there's this thing that guys do. I, did, I have another picture where someone actually put please flush only once up there, but guys will go up there and, like, flush that thing over and over again. I, I don't really know what's up with that. But anyways, there's sensors here to enforce, like, flushing once. Now, the reality is, like, you, you just make sure it flushes so it doesn't stink. But let's pretend like it fits to my story, right? So someone thought, like, we should conserve water. <laughs> We're going to put a sensor up here, and that way we'll control you know, how much water that's consumed. But then they forgot to replace this thing. So you're really just like wasting this huge amount of water down here. And you've had this kind of like problem in your meatware, this problem in your process of not thinking end to end enough. You've installed this fancy uh, you know, kind of like touchless Internet of Things thing up here. And uh, you've ignored the legacy stuff below, and you're not really like pulling through the, to solve the, the problem as a whole. Sort of a pain metaphor once you figure out that my, uh, my facts are all wrong, but it's fun to put urinals up there. But so, you know, translating that into like what I actually see in the industry, this is, this is a survey from a, uh, a Gartner conference. You know, conference surveys are a little weird, but they're very uh, illustrative, directional, as the kids like to say. And this question asks, like, it's a little leading. It's like, what is going wrong with your private cloud? Maybe the public cloud project's going awesome, right? Uh, but if, if you look at the answers, it, it gets to this idea that we installed a private cloud, whatever it may be, and like only 5% of the people, probably the people in this room, like are doing a great job. Like there's nothing wrong. Their private cloud project worked out fine. And, and over the years when I worked on strategy at, at Dell, doing cloud strategy and as an analyst, like I would see this repeated over and over again. People would think like that, that, that rainbow throw up's gonna cover us and it's gonna save us. So they get the throw up all in their data center. And then it's just like, it just sits there. There's just like this blinking cursor of cloudiness. And they haven't really thought through, kind of like with the urinals, like, now what do I do with it? How do I get something that works out well with it? How do I get good software on top of it? What do I do with it? And this, this kind of sentiment is, is, is what we, we see a lot when we uh, go out uh, into the field and talk with people. But again, the notion is that the issue is not really the technology. The issue is, is, is the meatware that we have. And, and having to coming up with a strategy for what you're going to do with cloud and DevOps and all this, and not just sort of installing the technology like those, those misplaced sensors. I guess they weren't misplaced, sort of half-assed approach to fixing the, uh, the Columbus bathroom. So then also, I, this is the, 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 uh, the other issue that we have. Conveniently, Eeyore is a donkey, so he fits in here. But you know, it's like my, my favorite quote from Eeyore is like, you know, it's not much of a tale, but I'm sort of attached to it. Like, and, and this is almost like the sentiment that I encounter IT people having, right? Like, they don't really smile very much. They're usually pretty like, down, like they don't really think they can accomplish very much. They can't go from those two circles to that owl very effectively. So, uh, you know, this is like the, 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 the huge motivation that we have is like we really need to cheer these guys up or the, these folks up. And uh, I, I, think, I think there's one story with EO where he has a happy day and smiled, if I remember. We just, that's, that's our goal. We just want to get him his, his little wood shack up and uh, make him happier, improve the IT departments. So that was a lot of information. So now we'll have a little break. Very popular image, so I've got that. All right, so how can we cheer up those Eeyores out there? What, what, are, what are things that we can do? Now, these are just 
a, a, a few of the sort of like top tips and ways of thinking to like start living a uh, mentally healthier lifestyle in the IT department, uh, so to speak. So the first thing that I, that I like to point out is, you know, as, as the uh, uh, excruciatingly small type up there says, more, this is all more or less, but when you're going about planning how you're going to do all this in your organization, you're thinking about how to improve your, orga your IT organization and how to get DevOps in there, I would start to think of DevOps and continuous delivery as the same thing, right? Now, obviously, they're not the same thing, but they, they basically go together hand in hand, right? Like, if you're doing DevOps and you're not doing continuous delivery, it seems like a lot of work for, like, not a benefit. And if you're doing continuous delivery, it's really not going to work unless you're doing DevOps type of stuff as well, right? So, you know, someone out there probably has some uh, non-liberal arts degree and can tell me the, the, the technical term for that kind of relationship. But those two things se seem to pop up with each other all the time. It's symbiotic to be all biological. Now, we all kind of know what, what a, a continuous delivery pipeline is. The important part that I like to go over is this bottom part, this feedback loop, right? So what you're getting with this is if you're delivering software every week or maybe every day, you're getting this feedback loop that's coming in and telling you how your software is doing, right? You can run experiments, you can improve it, and contrast this with having basically software that's delivered every six months or 12 months, right? Like that's a long time to wait to try something new. But using this feedback loop is what you need to start doing when you get this process into place because that's what's gonna allow you to address and improve the craft of your, your, your application of your software and improve your services and make things better, right? And if, if you're not thinking about how you're using that feedback loop, then there's, you're not, you're again, you're, you're, you're uh, sort of like, you're gonna be in that sad chart of, of, pie, of, of cloud usage, right? Like you've got to uh, pay attention to how you incorporate the feedback loop in there. So the next thing, uh, especially when you go out regionally to DevOps days, is uh, people like bemoan the idea that like, well, I can't hire all those fancy unicorns, right? Like I, I, there's no way I can get the right kind of people. I mean, they say this to us at Pivotal, like, oh, that's fine for you, Pivotal, to talk about like pair programming and like cloud native stuff, but we live in the real world, so we'll be going back to our punch cards. I mean, essentially is what they seem to be saying, but there's this, I, you know, it, it was uh, quoted in Twitter, so it must have actually happened. There's an attribution, you can check my facts back down there. Um, and also, uh, again, to reference again, um, Andrew Schaefer, uh, who, who, uh, who I work with, he, uh, he has a great presentation down there over just this concept, right? That really, you have all the people that you need in your organization to accomplish what you want, right? Like, as this, as this quote gets to, someone was, was talking to Adrian Kokrov at Netflix and saying, like, ah, but you have everyone, and he's like, oh, we hired them from you, right? Like, we poached all these people from, from your organizations, and we just gave them the context and the training, and we changed the meatware around so that they could be successful, which probably applies to any organization, right? Like, people are actually pretty pliable plastic things if you just know what to do with them correctly. They're not unruly like software. So, uh, you know, you've got the staffing there in place. Now, the other thing... Uh, that, that I like to remind people of is that you're going to end up building a huge stack of stuff, right? Like a bunch of stuff that's going to help run your, your software basically, right? And it's, it's, you know, it's still at the end of the day still software. So you need to run it somewhere. You've got to manage its configuration. You've got to like monitor it. You've got to integrate it together, have it, have it, uh, have it interact with each other. Like all the same problems you're going to end up having. And, and this is, you know, the intention of the rhetorical intention of this diagram is like, oh, that's confusing in a lot of things, which is the point, right? Like having this full stack, this platform is something that you're going to end up with. And, and I've noticed over the years that people often end up with what I call an accidental platform. They, they wake up one day and they're like, oh, I've got this platform. There's probably some WebSphere in here and some Linux. And it's just like this big stack of stuff. And they didn't really like plan it out ahead of time. They didn't really think about what we would need for this. It's just kind of what they ended up with. So, so be aware of, of what you have there. And, and it might even be good to start planning ahead and like think about a platform that you would want to have in place. Whether you build your own or you use one off the web or off the shelf, like think about what it is you want in there and focus on the requirements that you have. And, and I, like, I like this thing from Simon Wardley. It's like here, summing up the, uh, the uh, there's another uh, login request there. Got to go talk to those donkeys. But, um, <laughs> like, like, you know, there, there's, there's a good summary of, like, th this is a good representation of, like, all the stuff you need in the stack. And don't, don't, don't be myopic and focus on just one of them. Make sure that you've got all the bases covered. Because, again, that's going to be the way that you deliver software better. And just make sure that you're planning ahead for what your platform is instead of having to, uh, you know, go watch a bunch of videos to see how to manage things. Oh, there's some, something crazy is happening. It's like the, uh, the Docker police are coming after me now. <laughs> oh, here we go. 
I'll, I'll hand this. You can be in charge of this. <laughs> it's a Chromebook, so it must be easy to use. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the next thing, uh, the, and, and, and this, this is a huge shift that I like to emphasize. It may seem kind of like boring for people who wear hoodies and uh, hair. I, I shouldn't be rude and, and burden no, you with something. I, I okay. Uh, so, anyways, um, many of the people that I, I, I speak with are sort of in, the, in the, the middle management and above layers, right? And the kind of therapy that I like to give them is your job in this context changes a lot as well, right? Like, to, to use an analogy, there's, there's two great books, if, if you're kind of in this position, you can read through, which are good manuals for how to manage in, in an agile DevOpsy kind of world, what management does. But there's an analogy I like to use. Probably, probably uh, like, like, uh, like me, most of you uh, led an exciting uh, teen years. Maybe even now you still play role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Things like that. And there's this role called the Dungeon Master, right? And the Dungeon Master is the one who like creates the game and like runs it, and there's players who play as well. And like, I, you know, it's fun when you find a manager who knows what this is, but like, I like to think of what management's role here is as being more like a dungeon master, right? Like they're, they're creating the game and the constraints and kind of guiding people along, but they also need the players or the employees who have the skills and who, who are going on the adventure on the mission and, and really like acting it out. And it's the combination of those two folks working together that really makes an enjoyable game. And similarly, when you're trying to be innovative and come up with new software and really inject software into your company, you need management to provide that structure for you, right? Now, in contrast, you kind of need this, but you don't need management who's like, every week you come in front of me and like, you're kind of like a supplicant and you present the magic slides of status and then I allow you to survive another week, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a dire way of putting it, but that's a lot of how management kind of thinks that they're supposed to operate, kind of like a monitoring, like a captain of a ship who's not really like helping out. But in this kind of environment, management has to kind of step in and really start like leading change management and getting their, 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 I was gonna say feet dirty, but getting their hands dirty with, uh, with a lot of the actual work and help out instead of just figuring that the team's gonna handle it. Because the team's not really gonna have the responsibility and visibility for all of the type of decisions and strategy setting and things that management does. And again, those are, those are two great books that go over metrics, how to select things, and, and management's roles there. But in, in y'all's situation, if, make sure that your management is engaged in the things that you're doing, and if they're not, things are probably not gonna work out uh, very well, and vice versa. So to that end, one of the things that management needs to do more of is start thinking about uh, how they manage the portfolio that you have. Now, don't fall asleep. Portfolio management is usually like a snoozer. But think about portfolio management is basically the way that you, uh, if, you, if you like those, what are those games where you're stocking up resources for the battles or whatever, right? Like, it's basically the resource management that you're doing with your company. So if you're like most companies, you have this thing that we call legacy IT, or as I like to think about it, the stuff that makes all the money. And that consumes a lot of your effort and time. And you have to manage that legacy or you'll never have room to come up with the new things, right? Like you'll, you'll basically be stuck and weighed down by this legacy management. So you at least need some way of managing your portfolio of applications and services that make sure that legacy doesn't consume all of your effort so that you have time to come up with new things. And, and really, to, to be brief here, like just ask yourselves, does my organization have a way of managing the portfolio? Do I even care, right? Like, and if, if you don't have a way of managing your portfolio, you're probably not gonna get the spare capacity that you need to do new, th new and innovative stuff. And you need to emphasize with your organization that they have to actively manage this stuff. Otherwise, uh, sadness will occur. So, tactically, uh, before we get to the last slide, um, one thing that I've noticed when people are adopting DevOps and cloud and trying to become these software-defined businesses is, uh, you know, much to the chagrin of like enterprise sales people the world around, like you don't start with a gigantic big project. You want to start with like a small project as possible for several reasons. One, you're probably going to have no idea what you're doing, right? Like, and you're going to need to like uh, fail at it so you can learn, right? Start thinking about failure and learning as, as the same thing. It's, unless you're some sort of genius, maybe everyone in this room, uh, like basically, you know, t learning is essentially failing over and over again to figure something out. So you need to have this small project that you can learn these new ways, learn technologies, really engage that feedback loop and so forth and so on. And then you want to kind of snowball that upward into bigger projects. Like don't start with something big, start with a series of small projects. Now, the other tactical thing you get from this is that if you fail at it, no one will know. 
right? Like you can like dust it under the rug. Like there, apparently there's companies that have like what, uh, just to be all alliteration guy, there's very caustic corporate cultures where like if you fail, you very quickly go from like the VP of having a P&L to the VP of special projects, which is usually not a good move. And so failure is not really something that's accepted in big companies. So you want to structure it such that you can, you know, set up learning and, and eventually roll that into uh, to larger success. And there's, there's kind of a, a case study that we have, one of our customers, Humana, who went through just this cycle. And, and they built up small successes to get to a big momentous uh, release at the end. And, and you see that everywhere, right? This is a general pattern that people use. So scope your initial, let's say, three projects appropriately. Don't, don't eat the, the elephant all at once, let alone the, the brontosaurus or whatever it is we're supposed to call them nowadays. So uh, finally, um, this question comes up a tremendous amount. So I, I always like to go over it. People ask, uh, they ask me like what the IT organization looks like and, and what the sizing of it is. And there's sort of like a simple rule of thumb that you probably want to put most of your resources on the parts that you care the most about. And I would suggest that what you want to care the most about is what's excitingly titled business capability. Well, that is the applications, the software, the things that are being used, right? So that's probably the most valuable thing that generates money the most, right? Now, depending on what your business is, there, you might be providing a service or something like that. But what we tend to see with people who are taking this approach is more, mo most of the people are at that top layer, right? And this is where a lot of the DevOps teams are, right? So there's software developers up there, QA people, product managers, and operational people who make sure that that stuff all runs from day one, right? Who, this is where you have all the integrated teams that we talk about. Now, underneath that, you remember I was saying you're, you're going to have an accidental platform or a purposeful one. You also have teams that end up managing the platform, and that is the product they work on, right? So that platform is, is a piece of software, essentially, that has to be managed and run and like added new capabilities and features to it. So you have a team that is either making it for yourselves, like a build your own platform, or it's the team that's in charge of extending whatever platform you might have gotten off the web or from a vendor or whatever, right? They add new customized services and make it fit to, to all, of, all of the strange riddles of security and load balancing and all of that stuff that you have to deal with. Now, underneath that, you have uh, what, what the unicorns like to call the, uh, the SREs, the site reliability engineers. And they're, they're, as, as this funneling thing would suggest, there's a smaller and smaller amount at each of these layers. And those are the people who keep things up and running, right? Like they get very excited about blinking lights and logs and like troubleshooting stuff. And hopefully, the platform that you have takes care of most of that stuff for you. So you don't have these people involved in like meetings to plan out and provision servers and do all this kind of stuff, right? So again, the, the number that you have there lessens and lessens because the platform in the middle is taking care of most of that stuff. And then you're taking those resources and putting them up at the application layer. And then finally, like uh, turns out we live in a three-dimensional real world. So you need people who manage the data center and put hardware in and wire stuff up. I mean, you're always going to need that kind of stuff, I guess, unless it turns out we're living in some sort of solipsistic like dream world. But you know, that's what we'll be dreaming about, wiring things up. But the point is that, like, think about the structure of your organization, how it is now, right? And if, if you want to be one of these organizations that's defined by the software that they deliver, this is, sort, this is what things are ending up looking like. And there's, there's a great interview I did with this guy who uh, works for our government, the federal government, at, at the GSA, Diego there. And he kind of goes over how this structure emerged with the approach that they had, um, if, if you're interested in, in more details there. So before we wrap up, just, just another uh, mind clearer there. As people always like to say, we're hiring. If, if you like this kind of stuff, you can come be in our burger. <laughs> uh, and and I, just, I wanted to throw out some, uh, in, in good John Willis tradition, recommend you more reading than you'll ever have time to do. Um, so I, I referenced the, uh, the leading the transformation over here. That's, that's really a great book that's very uh, tersely written and therefore easy to read that goes over how you, how you change large organizations over and, and uh, kind of like from a management layer, how you manage that. And, and Lean Enterprises is, it's basically, as it says, like this omnibus, this encyclopedia. Like if you haven't been reading the internet for the past five years, you can just read that book. It'll catch you up on all the thinking that's been happening. Like to an almost nauseating degree, it's got Colonel Boyd in there and all, all the great like ideas, like written up in there in, in a nice way. It's even got some Jeffrey Moore for people who like that. Uh, and, and I just, I'd wrapped up a series explaining like what the, the migration journey is for doing all of this, which goes into a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail if you're interested in that. You can, you can find that, uh, you can find that at, our, at our website or just searching around. And 
Finally, uh, we have this book, which goes over a lot of architecture and software uh, development practices. You can come get a copy of it for free if you want or get it on our website. But it actually is, it's, it's kind of like Lean Enterprise, except only 80 pages. It just condenses together a lot of thinking into one, one mostly coherent uh, sort of uh, discourse about it. So with that, uh, you know, thanks uh, for, for, for listening to all this. Hopefully it was helpful and kind of set up uh, like what, what we'll be doing here over the next few days. Like it, it really is, it's, it's, a good, it's a great privilege for, for all you folks to be here and kind of hang out in this milieu and the breakfast was pretty nice, crispy bacon and sausage. Sometimes you just get muffins, right? So that, that was good. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, if, if you come by the table, we're, I, we're gonna give away a, a free Safari membership. Uh, you can go to that. You can get the slides for the presentation there and also register for this giveaway. Only one person will be selected. But when it asks you for the password, it's donkeys. But yeah, uh, with that, I, I, I appreciate you guys listening, and I'd love for you to come by and, uh, and, and tell me what you think of this and, and, and what y'all are up to. So thanks. <laughs>